Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our spring FUBON Fireside Chat. I'm Kathleen DeRose. I'm a professor here at the Stern School of Business. And I'm also the director of the FUBON Center for Technology, Business, and Innovation. I'm thrilled to be here this evening with Professor Terry O'Dean to discuss his paper, Attention into Induced Trading and Returns, Evidence from Robinhood Traders. Professor O'Dean, welcome. You're famous for your revealing studies of retail traders and investors. Just by way of background, how did you get into this fascinating subject? Well, let's see. I, uh, I'm a college dropout and I went back to finish my undergraduate degree when I was just before I turned 38. And uh, I got very interested in the work Daniel Kahneman is, was doing. He was teaching at UC Berkeley at the time. I took a couple of classes with him and I went to his, he lived about two blocks from here at the time. I went to his house one day, uh, one Saturday morning to talk about grad school and basically to say, can I be your student? I wanted to get a PhD. And over the course of two hours, Danny convinced me that I should apply for PhD programs in finance. And one of the things he pointed out was that behavioral finance, there were people doing it, uh, you know, Bob Schiller, uh, Richard Thaler, uh, uh, Hirsch Sheffer and Amir Staffman, people do, but it, as a field, it hadn't really taken off. So um, this was, I guess, probably 89. And um, Danny said, that could be a great thing from an academic point of view. He said, you could be in a field when it takes off, be one of the early people in. And then from a practical point of view, he said, and if things don't work out, you'll have a PhD in finance and you can always go to industry and make more money than you would have as an academic. So I thought, okay, I'll study finance. And then a couple of years, Two years later, I was sitting in a class on macroeconomics that George Ekerloff was teaching. And George sort of paused his lecture and said, those of you, there was a PhD class, those of you who are doing empirical research, don't just take some tired, worn out database and try to squeeze one more dissertation out of it. He said, find a question that you wanna answer and ask yourself, what data do I need to answer that question? And then go out and get the data. Well, I had, I had just maybe two weeks earlier read a paper by Statman Sheffrin on the disposition effect, the tendency of investors to hold on to losers and sell winners, which was motivated by Kahneman Tversky's work. And I, I had traded as an individual investor a bit too much myself, and I knew I had behaved that way. So I thought to myself, okay, I'd like to test this theory. And ideally, I'd like to test it with data on from individual investors at a discount brokerage firm so that I didn't have to talk about agency relationships. You know, was the advisor giving this advice for reasons that benefited the advisor? So I decided, well, I'll just get data from a discount brokerage firm. Uh, it wasn't quite that easy. It took me about 11 months, uh, but I eventually got the data, tested the disposition effect, found that indeed I wasn't the only one with the disposition effect, and uh, then decided to keep studying individual investors to try to show that individual investors on average behave the way Kahneman, Tversky, and other uh, behavioral decision theorists thought they did not the way that many economists had assumed they did. This is amazing because we're going to go from like Nobel Prize winners and your research to Robin Hood traders all in the course of the next 45 minutes. So I, I think you've spent literally years studying retail traders. And I'm wondering before we get into the Robin Hood uh, case, what are some common insights that have come out of your work, some of which is now you know, very well recognized and understood, but what are, the, what are some of the common characteristics of retail traders in general? All right. So... Well, one thing I just mentioned, there's this tendency to hold on to losers, uh, sell your winners. There are various ways to understand why we do that. I think the simplest is simply emotions. When you sell for a loss, you feel bad. If you hold on to that loser, you can tell yourself, it's just a paper loss. It'll come back. 
when you solve for a gain, you feel good. People prefer to feel good. So, but it does run contrary to what's optimal from a tax perspective. From a tax perspective, you should be harvesting your losses. And I did indeed find that one month out of the year, people sold losers at a faster rate than winners. And that was December. December. Right yeah. before the end of the tax. You know, I, I figured there were a lot of accountants calling them up and saying, you should really sell some losers. So that's one thing. Uh, it's a very strong effect. It's been established in different assets in many different countries. Uh, I think more important though, in terms of welfare is that individual investors tend to trade too much in the sense that they reduce their returns through active trading. I wrote about, I wrote the theory paper about overconfidence as part of my dissertation and then went on to sort of test the implications of that um, theory paper. I, I don't claim that overconfidence is the only reason people trade too much, but it's one reason. Basically, if you think you know more than you do, you're more likely to trade than if uh, you realize that that maybe you don't. I, a question I tell my students to ask themselves before they trade a specul make a speculative trade. And by the way, this is after I telling them, telling them not to trade speculatively. But that if they're going to make a speculative trade, they should ask themselves why the person on that other side of that trade is trading and who that person likely is. Because chances are in the US, chances are the counterparty to your trade is a professional trader. Yeah. Someone who is making a living trading and making a living trading with people who in other respects seem a lot like you. Yeah, no, now, there, I think a great insight. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the context of behavioral finance that you've laid out and this whole idea that people have loss aversion and everything. It's, it's great context to talk about, to talk about uh, Robin Hood and it certainly is informed by your research. I'm wondering if we could just kind of set the, set the setting for the Robinhood investor, because we fast forward from when you first started studying retail investors to today, we've had a dramatic drop in the quote unquote cost of freighting, trading to free, at least on the Robinhood and other platforms now. Um, so the context has shifted and some are calling this a, a retail renaissance, but it sounds like those same behaviors might crop up. So maybe if you could just from your research so far, and then we'll get into some of the questions you were trying to answer in your paper, but briefly describe how the Robin Hood trader looks compared to other retail traders. Are they meaningfully different? Sure. So let me give a little context. Um, if you go back, well, I suspect there are not that many people on the call who can go back to uh, 50 years when they were investing. But if you, if you went back 50 years, the world was very different for retail investors. Uh, where did you get your information? Maybe from the, you know, your local newspaper. Uh, if you lived in New York, you had the luxury of uh, the Wall Street Journal. You could turn on on a Friday night and watch Louis Rukeyser talk on Wall Street Week, get some ideas from him and maybe trade on Monday. But this was all slow process. And when Monday came, you had to get your broker on the phone to say, hey, I'd like to make a trade. So it was... Uh, and on top of that, it costs you a bundle. You know, you're, if you traded, I think if you traded a uh, hundred, there's a, a, a paper I read recently, a hundred or 200 shares at uh, $10 a share, it costs you, you know, $26 or something. The commissions were pretty high. You would have been hard put to find an index fund back in uh, 1971. There were a few mutual funds around, but not many that, I don't think there were very many available for individuals to easily access and it was expensive. So the world changed. Uh, chances are human psychology has not changed as much in those 50 years as the environment in which we make decisions. These days, all of this has changed. You can get information 24 seven from all sorts of sources. Uh, you, if you, you, know, you can chat with other people, find out what other investors are, are thinking or doing. That was, other than your brother-in-law and next door neighbor, that was a difficult thing to do 50 years ago. Uh, you can trade 
instantly. That, now that's been true for a while. E-Trade had an ad back in 1999 that started off, it was a black screen and said, it's 2 a.m. and you wanna place a trade for that fast moving stock you've been following without waking your baby or your broker, it's time for E-Trade. I actually used to show that ad when I gave public talks and say, when you wake up at two or three in the morning with a great idea or in a cold panic and ready to sell everything, it's time to go back to sleep. Yeah. Uh, sometimes making things easier doesn't make them better. So these days, you don't have to call your broker. You don't. You can just pull your phone out and in seconds, you can play it to trade. It's easy to trade. Information is all over the place. Uh, as far as the cost of trading goes, commissions came down basically in 1975. There was a deregulation and, and discount brokers started. Commissions came down for a while, then they came down a lot in the 90s. And as, as you mentioned, you can now pay zero commissions. What drove the, dro the drop in commissions? A lot of it uh, was it's driven by technology, making it less expensive to execute trades for brokerage firms and payment for order flow. I actually, I actually met Bernie Madoff at a conference in Memphis in 1994. And what he was, what he was doing in those days before his you know, claim to fame was he had a brokerage firm that was paying for order flow. I don't think he invented it, but he really popularized this whole idea of payment for order flow. That's when a market maker or a market making firm, or these days a high speed trading firm says to a brokerage firm, usually a discount brokerage firm, send us the orders from your retail clients and we'll pay you for that. I met him. And then uh, six or seven years later, I was giving a talk in Chicago and the person after me was Joe Ricketts, who is the CEO of Ameritrade. And Ameritrade at the time had ads that, about how you could place a trade for $8 a trade, any trade. And I got up and said, people trade too much. And Joe got up after me and said, Professor Dean thinks people trade too much. He's probably right. I'm just making it cheap. <laughs> and I had to say that, you know, and we talked, he and I talked uh, during a break and I asked him about payment for order flow. He said, well, I couldn't be doing this without payment for order flow. Yeah. So um, that, so one thing about payment for order flow is it gives the impression that something is free that isn't really free. It's just someone, you're not paying to trade now. Someone else is paying for the privilege of trading with you. So it's an industry practice. And since we're on the, the topic and kind of setting the stage for the Robin Hood events, and we'll, we'll get into your paper in a second, maybe let's talk about, first of all, we've mentioned the growth of payment for order flow, which is used by all the discount brokers, but maybe just describe how much payment for order flow Robin Hood pays people like Citadel and the degree to which it's greater than some of the other discount brokers. Sure. And this would be a fine time to see if I can share uh a graphic. This is from the New York Times, and it's showing how much payment for order flow Robinhood gets per dollar in the average account. And a good contrast is with Schwab, because Schwab and Robinhood, as of last May, had approximately the same number of, of accounts. It was 13 million versus 12.7 million. And you can see Robinhood is getting about almost a hundred times as much payment for order flow per dollar in uh, in in the account. Ameritrade is getting um, ten times as uh, I, I, Schwabenhood's getting ten times as much as Ameritrade, and about a hundred times as much as uh, Schwab. Uh, last year, Robinhood got was paid about six hundred eighty-seven million in payment for order flow. Um, so it's a lot of money and it's materially different at Robinhood than other brokerage firms. And other brokerage firms, other discount firms are also 
benefiting from payment for order flow, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a difference in degree, substantial. So this gives you, this. there's a clear message here, right? So I don't know if you want to flip off the slide again, but um, the, the clear message here is that somebody's buying this information and the information coming out of Robinhood trading is more valuable to the purchaser than trades from another book. So Robinhood's book of business is, looks meaningfully like materially different than, than others, which brings us to your, to your paper and maybe just talk about sort of what questions you were asking what, we, what your hypotheses were in the paper and the, the data you, you used, which came from partly from Robinhood, which is pretty interesting. Maybe just sure. describe the, the paper itself and what you found there. We'll start getting into that. Right. Uh, so we look at Robin track data. Uh, I think it's May of um, 2018 through August of 2020. Robinhood's uh, website made it possible to see how many Robinhood users, account holders, owned each stock. It was updated roughly every every hour. And there was this uh, you know, website, RobinTrack, that uh, scraped or pulled, grabbed all that data and made it publicly available. So what we're able to see with roughly uh, you know, an, uh, granularity of about an hour is how many Robinhood users own each stock. So what we don't see is how many shares each of them own. So what we have to go with in this paper is uh, increases or decreases in the number of uh, Robinhood users that own a stock. What we thought we would find is that Robinhood users would be more highly, more affected by attention than other investors who are also affected by attention. So Brad Barber and I had written a paper previously in which we sort of asked the question, how do investors pick stocks to buy? There are thousands of stocks out there. And you know, human beings don't like a problem. You know, if, if, I, if I gave you a box of folders and I said, I, you know, I, I said to you, uh, Kathleen, here are 4,000 folders with information about all the stocks you might buy. Could you come back in a couple of days and tell me which one you like best, second best, third best, fourth best? You know, that, that's not something human beings like to do. You can program a computer, the model. Yeah. do that sort of thing. But so we thought, okay, clearly, the average investor is not constantly going through all of the choices and saying, oh, this one is suddenly optimal. And by the way, most investors don't own that many different stocks. So at the discount brokerage firm where I was able to obtain a couple of data sets uh, from the late 80s and then from the 90s, people held three to four stocks on average. And that appears to be the same thing at Robinhood. At Robinhood, you have about 13 million users as of last May with 42 million different stock user positions. So again, uh, in the neighborhood of three, three stocks, obviously some people will own more, but those are averages. So what Brad and I thought was, okay, people aren't doing a systematic search. What's probably going on is a stock catches their attention and then they ask themselves, do I want to buy this stock or not? Does it appeal to me? So you might have two traders. Uh, let's have a momentum trader and you're a Graham and Dodd style uh, uh, fundamentals uh, in investor. And we both look at the same dozen stocks, let's say they're you know, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I, I decide I'm going to buy one that's had positive earnings surprises for the last three quarters because I know that what goes up goes up. And you choose something else that has sound fundamentals. Maybe it's been a little bit out of favor, but you think. So we make different choices. Our preferences and beliefs matter, but attention takes the choice set from thousands down to a manageable number, a dozen stocks. So we thought this is true for everyone, but we thought it might be more true for Robinhood users for a few reasons. So this is the equivalent of, of using like heuristic thinking or just like rule of thumb thinking as opposed to long-term planning to pick stocks. Yeah, but this is solving, right. Yeah. It's solving a problem, you know, to solve that, to do it, what you might say the right way that you would teach your students is an 
is a huge problem. And this is just, it, it, it's, yeah, it's how, it's how people tend to make decisions. By the way, it doesn't affect selling as much because if you only own three stocks, you can easily say, do I want to sell A, B, or C? Most individual investors don't sell short. That means they don't sell stocks they don't own. In fact, Robinhood doesn't let one thing that I <laughs> Robinhood does not let its users sell short. They, you know, they they can buy put options, which has a similar. Uh, it's a bet against a stock, but they can't sell short, which uh, probably is a. A good thing for most of them. So it so attention doesn't affect selling as much as buying. It tends to affect. Well, we we hypothesize it would affect Robinhood investors more because they tend to be less experienced. Uh, according to the New York Times, half of the Robinhood users had not had brokerage accounts before they opened one up at Robinhood. Robinhood app also makes the environment seem. It, it makes investing seem easy. They display less information than most other brokerage websites, so it it looks it looks simple. Uh, there's you know if 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 you were to look at a page with lots and lots of PE ratios and growth ratios and all of these things, you know like hundreds of things, you would start to say, "Wow, this is for me. This is too complicated." Here it's simple. You think I can handle this, and as everyone knows, they've gamified. You set up your Robinhood account and you get confetti on your phone screen and you get things that say, congratulations, boom. Uh, it, it feels more uh, Fine. friendly and game-like. Mm -hmm. So we thought these are less experienced investors. They're gonna be swayed more easily by what catches their attention. We also thought that the app itself was likely to drive investor attention towards a more limited number of stocks, not through any, for any nefarious reasons, just because if you have a simple environment and it's only displaying a few things, those things end up in people's attention. And if those people are 13 million people, that even if 1% of them say, I think I'll buy something today, that ends up being a lot of purchases. So for these reasons, we thought the Robinhood users would be more swayed by attention, and that would lead to more hurting. Hurting in the sense of that they were, many of them buying the same stocks on the same day. And then consistent with our previous research, we thought, well, if that happens, it's gonna create price pressure on a stock that is largely unrelated to fundamentals. And more often than not, we'd expect that stock after it peaks to drift down a bit. And that's what we went, <laughs> that's what we went looking for. You know, we had a hypothesis and we said, let's look at events where there are big increases in the number of Robinhood users in a day and see whether in fact, after that day, these stocks underperform. That's, that is what we find. We use a couple of different definitions of uh, a hurting event. One of them is, um, well, conditional on having enough users, like 100 users at the beginning of the day. We say, let's look at the top half of 1% of stocks in terms of increase in users. And then the other, which is a more restrictive event, we say, okay, conditional on having a thousand user increase uh, and at least a 50% um, increase in the number of, of users, we'll call that a hurting event. And we find there's a drop off in price afterwards. Clearly some Robinhood users make money in all each of these events. So it's not like everyone's losing. However, when we look, when we look at a 30 day window, 10 days before the hurting event, and then 20 days after, we find that on average, these users are losing money. And it's probably about 5% over that period, or if you, do market adjustment 6%. So 
it's a substantial uh, uh, hit on the return. This, by the way, is not, the magnitudes are greater than what we've seen in previous studies. It's not by any means the first time that you see a study where you can show that when a bunch of individuals pile onto a stock, it, the price goes up and drops and then subsequently drops. You can see that around Kramer recommendations. When uh, Jim Kramer, you know, Mad Money, makes a recommendation, especially for a smaller, less liquid stock, stock, prices, stock price goes up and then goes back down. You can go back to Lewis Rookheiser in uh, Wall Street week, and the stocks recommended on Wall Street week on Friday night tended to go up the next Monday and then drift down over the next um, couple of weeks. So they're, but they're, the magnitudes of what we see with Robinhood are greater. Yeah, and you've got, I mean, you've, you've essentially created through dark patterns like technology shaping people's behavior, which they're susceptible to, as you pointed out, we're all humans susceptible to our embedded kind of instinctual biases. You've created this, this um, you know, basically gamified app that shapes your behavior. And we've also said that we've sort of created here almost like what Ben Graham would call a voting machine as opposed to a weighing machine, weighing fundamentals, because the information that people are relying upon is, is basically what other people are doing or momentum. And the consequences is, is, you know, not investment success here as, as you or I might define it as finance professors, you know, eating your vegetables and buying the index fund and saving for retirement. So does it boil down to, um, does it boil down to, you know, hey, this is a, a cheap learning experience or is it, is it something we should really be concerned about, about the impact on people just entering, you know, the financial system through this app? Well, I don't know where things go. I have friends who work at Robinhood who are hoping that what this, that, you know, they're hoping that the user base matures in the sense of, okay, we got people to start investing in their 20s who might have waited till their 30s or 40s to do so. Good thing. But they currently have some questionable habits. Not such a good thing. But right now, most of them, and obviously that's not everyone, most of them aren't playing with serious money. So I, I believe that the average uh, account is around $2,000. Um, I'm not saying you know, that everyone can afford to lose $2,000, but it's quite likely that many of the Robinhood users are not taking gambles that will hurt them badly. But we also know uh, from, you know, and you know, what I've read in the press is that there clearly are some who have taken hits that they could not afford. And there is a risk that as people get excited, you know, certainly around GameStop, all the excitement, reading about it, and that you have you may have people who put money into, you know, they start to think, oh, this is this is my ticket to success, or everyone says this is a sure thing, or I'm going to be part of this and risk money that they can't afford to lose. So it's not the, the type of trading that we document is not uh, on average could be good for the investors. And it's not particularly good for markets if you're concerned about markets reflecting uh, fundamental value. I suspect that the vast majority of Robinhood users are not losing next month's rent or mortgage payment, but probably some are. I don't know what the solution is precisely. Uh, I think they are being, you know, Richard Th uh, Thaler's. Um, and Cass Sustain wrote about nudging. Yeah. And you can nudge people in different directions. And I, I would say Robinhood is doing some hard nudging. And a lot of that nudging is in a direction that's not necessarily in people's best interest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny because I, I, I recall turning 18 and having played a lot of cards as a kid with my family, deciding I was going to be the greatest poker player ever, taking my allowance, which was 20 bucks, walking into a casino, 
walking up to the blackjack table, losing it instantly, like in the first five minutes and never wanting to gamble again. So one could be saying that, look, learn by doing is a stupid tax. Everyone pays it at some point in their life and not so bad. But I want to pick up on a point you just made, which is the impact on the broader market. So the agglomeration of these traders, and you also made a very good point that Robinhood could outgrow this as Robinhood traders, as Robinhood grows, kind of converge with you know, what Schwab traders look like and how they behave. But clearly today, there are more leverage, more options, more speculative stocks, more volatile stocks, et cetera. And this contributed to the problems that Robinhood had in January for sure. So maybe we can take up a little bit of the implications on the market as a whole. I think there was one other study indicating that while retail traders only account for something like 0.2% of all trading, they explained something like 10% of the cross-sectional volatility in the market recently. So they are having an impact. And as you pointed out, early, as you pointed out earlier, the other side of these trades are mostly professional traders as off-exchange trading done by folks like Citadel are the ones that are picking up this, this book. So what do you think the implications are for you know, other retail traders, other traders in the marketplace? Are, are Robinhood traders you know, moving the market or are they in turn getting exploited by others? Well, clearly, and this is what our study shows, that over short periods, uh, they move markets. And you know they're not moving. They're not you know they tend to move smaller capitalization stocks. Uh, you know it's it's hard to move Apple. It's I mean I'd say maybe that you move it a little distance, but you know it's so smaller stocks. Um, if enough people pile in and buy, the price goes up. And it doesn't necessarily come plummeting down if they continue to hold. And this is one of the things we saw with GameStop, which is if enough people want to buy, the short sellers don't necessarily win by betting against. You know, the short sellers are looking at it and saying the fundamentals don't make any sense. And I think almost every financial economist believes that in the long run, the fundamentals are what matter. But as uh, Keynes famously said, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So, uh, <laughs> true. Yeah. so yeah. No, prices so you, can get, go ahead. No, you, you, you mentioned, so the impact being, okay, there's forced buyers. So short sellers having to cover positions and yeah, I'm not, it, it, so when, when I worry about market participants at night, and usually I try not to just because I, for the same reason, I try not, you know, you don't want to trade at night. It's not the clearest thinking, but when I'm worried about market participants, it's usually about less experienced retail investors, particularly those who don't understand that they, that they shouldn't be putting money they can't afford to lose into small, into highly concentrated speculative bets. Yeah, the the professional short sellers can take care of themselves. Yes, so, some so. of them, you know, some of them lost a lot of money, and at other times they make a lot of money, and well, certainly even over GameStop, there was a lot of money made by professionals. Uh, the it it creates volatility in the markets, which has a weird. A, a, a weird effect of attracting some people and pushing others away. So maybe just to pick up on that point, because one of the things that struck me was the analogy to uh, to political markets polarizing under the influence of social media. Because if you think of a marketplace, a financial marketplace is, is about information provision, right? And we've just said that these newfound traders often don't trade on what we would consider financially relevant information they trade on momentum or news or whatever else they can find. And the GameStop phenomenon is quite interesting in that respect in that it suggests this nascent effect of social media encouraged trading. And instead of having people who are separated in the marketplace, buyers and sellers, which make a market by a few points or a slightly different view of fundamentals, we literally have people saying it's going to go to the moon or it's going to go to zero, the short sellers. 
And this, this to me reminds me of the polarization that has occurred in political markets and the, under the influence of basically machine learning driven algorithms um, shaping different views. So we have two different markets shaped by two different sources of information that are increasingly polarized. And so this is a, a phenomenon that likely won't go away as we have more effectively like makers in influencers or whatever in, in the marketplace. And I think it's worth it's worth thinking about this. And I'm wondering what you think about this this phenomenon and what it bodes for the market in general. Well, it's true. I must say I, I worry more about this phenomenon when it comes to politics, but uh, it's true in the market as well. So again, if you go, you know, if you back forward, back not back forward, back forward. If you go back 50 years. You got information, you know, Louis Rukeyser might not have been right when he said, and that looks like a sound investment, <laughs> but he probably wasn't deviating very far from the middle. You wouldn't have seen, oh, he just said that people should buy something that every analyst is, you know, down on. Yeah. So, and when you read the Wall Street Journal, were they always right? Of course not. But you got one point of view that was, somewhat central. It was very difficult. You know, you might find someone writing a newsletter that had more uh, extreme views. And, you know, every two weeks, your newsletter could arrive in the paper, in the mail, and you'd read it. But prior to the internet, it was difficult to get a wide range of uh, views. And there was also was more difficult to sort of seek out people with uh, whose views reinforced the ones uh, that you had. I used to, prior to this paper, I used to think, well, there's no real hurting in the market in the sense of somebody, an individual doing something because all the other individuals are doing the same thing. Because even in the 90s, there's no way to observe what other individual investors were doing. You could see that the market was up. You could see there was a lot of trading volume. You might reach the conclusion that it was largely individual investors buying high-tech stocks in 1999, but you didn't observe what they were thinking or doing. And now, actually, you can buy, not because the stock went up, because, but because you went to a chat site uh, and there were 100 people saying, we should all buy this. Yeah, so that, Warren, Warren Kitty told you to do it. And this, this is sort of exactly the interesting point, right? That um, some people say, oh, wisdom of crowds, but this is the opposite because to have wisdom of crowds, you need everybody's views to be independent. And this is, this is the polar opposite, right? Of people converging around um, information and coming from like Reddit or whatever, which could morph into disinformation actually. Yeah, I, I, yeah the wisdom of crowds. I, I remember reading the book, there's the anecdote about finding the submarine and how much the pig weighed. Weigh that against a history of crowds backing horrible political leaders and making disastrous decisions. Uh, I'm not sure that crowds are shooting better than 50-50. Yeah. Um, it's, but you're right, this is, it, it turns the market at least for a while into more of a voting machine than a weighing machine. It's like, while we really all like this company, and but it's effective in the, sh certainly in the short run, if a lot of people buy something because the price is, they think the price is gonna go up, it probably will go up. Yeah, that doesn't make the company more valuable, although there is a slight chance sometimes that you get this feedback. George Soros used to he wrote about this this idea that if the company's stock price goes up simply because people all think it's a great company, that does make it easier for that company now to go out and get raise capital. Yeah. And I think like was it GameStop is there. planning to yeah. issue additional equity. They say like. Hey, we don't know why people want to pay two hundred dollars a share, but if they do, we're willing to sell them a few. No, very, very interesting um, summary of your of your findings in your paper. And what's interesting about it is, of course, you are one of the first ones to write a paper about the Robin Hood, the Robin Hood traders. Very much fitting in the context of all this historical work you've done, but also demonstrating how 
uh, kind of extreme in their behaviors uh, characteristics, the Robinhood traders are at least at least today, and the impact they've had on the market. And I wonder if we could actually even broaden it out to just a more general discussion of of fintech and of market infrastructure, because this is one of the first instances where we've got essentially convergence between the, the, the users and the product or the users becoming the product in the case of, of Robinhood, like it has been occurring in other social media platforms. And I'm wondering, you know, what you think about that and some other implications of what we've learned about Robinhood and in, in the events in January. Well, FinTech is a large topic. Yes. Uh, there's, and like so many things, there's a a lot of good and a lot of potential problems. So FinTech has made a lot of areas of finance less expensive just because technology and computers facilitate transactions and, and things that were just complicated to do. Uh, FinTech also makes things very easy. And if there's something that you want to do, it's better generally if you can do it, if it's easy. But making things easier, um, so it, 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 economists will sometimes use the term friction to refer to when an, an action is difficult, or frictions make it more uh, difficult. And frictions can take the place of self-control. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this is one of the, the back, Brad Barber and I looked at early online traders quite a while ago. And we found that when people switched from phone-based to computer-based trading, they traded more actively and they traded more speculatively. It doesn't compare to how easy it is today. And, you know, Robin Hood has made it very easy. And so it makes it easy to do things that are good for you and easy to do things that may be less you know, less good. And then the other thing is we were just discussing that uh, information technology, including chat rooms and other forms, has created new ways to consolidate people to do the same thing at the same time. I, many um, uh, years ago, I, I, I did this project where I created a um, uh, object-oriented big market with institutional traders and individual traders. I was trying to study the, if, the, the impact of different biases in this, this market. And the market kept crashing. <laughs> it would run through so many years and then it would, uh, it would just crash. And it was a pretty realistic in a lot of ways. I, I had two types. I had uh, mutual fund objects and then hedge fund objects. And the hedge funds could go long or short. The mutual funds couldn't. They could borrow. They got noisy signals. All of this stuff as realistic as I thought I could make it. I presented this uh, at a conference called the Q Group. And Harry Markowitz raised his hand. And he said, your problem is that you're institutional investors are homogeneous. They're all doing the same thing at the same time. And when they get it wrong, every so often it, it destroys the market. Heterogeneity helps yes. even out the excesses mm -hmm. in markets. So one of the things that went away, or at least temporarily, is as you pointed out, with GameStop, you suddenly had people taking these very strong extreme positions. You had the hedge funds that were shorting and then the game stoppers were like, as if they were in a battle with the institutional traders rather than trying to buy stocks that were going for, of companies that were going to perform well economically over the next several years. Yeah. It was more of a, a, a battle of the teams. And that created coordinated uh, and extreme activities that um, aren't good for markets. Yeah, no, so we saw the effects of that, uh, certainly the fintech implications you've mentioned about whether the promise of democratization and lower cost and more transparency truly holds up or not. Really interesting question. Robinhood is a platform with two sides, the other side of these traders being professional market makers. And then the third one that maybe is a good uh, point to 
to pause on before we go to our Q&A period that the impact of that uh, did create a potential uh, issue for the market more broadly because when Robinhood got its $3.4 billion margin call at the end of January as a result of this risky book, uh, one wonders about the order of magnitude there as opposed to the Robinhood broker-dealer's size at the time um, with something like $225 million on deposit at the various clearinghouses. So this was an interesting event where Robinhood effectively got a bailout from its venture capital investors. And of course, what is now gonna move on and, and raise money in, in an IPO presumably. But um, do you think this is an indicator also of you know, Robinhood's impact on markets in general? I don't know. Uh, I, first of all, I expect that the bailout came at a price. I expect that the the people who came up with those three billion very quickly got good terms. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it, from what I've read, and now we're getting definitely out of my area of expertise. I'm not an expert in microstructure. Okay, always going uh, to end on a little speculative yeah, speculation. Right. We're yeah. not talking about individual investor behavior here. Right. My understanding is that this was there's a there's old saying say a rule of thumb: never ascribe. Uh, to bad intent, what can be explained by incompetence. Um, I think that Robinhood just got itself caught short, that they'd grown so fast yeah. that the, um, you know, they'd outgrown their capital and the capital demands depend on the volatility of these underlying positions. I, I know there has been, and I don't know, if, and I have no inside information here. I know there are people who felt that, uh, Robinhood was sort of bailing out the short sellers and and by stopping trading for a while and stuff. Um, I think, you know, and then the question is, well, what would have happened if they'd gone belly up? Uh, what if those people hadn't shown up? There'd be some disruption, but I suspect that the S&P wouldn't be in a dramatically different place than it, today than it, than it is. And if so, it might even be in a more rational place. Um, that yeah. relative to, you know. Well, I guess we'll, we'll, it'll be some things to look for uh, when we do see the, the Robinhood S1 that'll be interesting uh, to investigate. But this is a, a fantastic summary of your recent work, very unique because you did use the Robinhood database, especially trading during outages. Super interesting insights about retail investor behavior and how Robinhood traders were special with lots of implications for fintech and for markets in general. And uh, let's open it up to, to questions for the last few minutes uh, after a really interesting discussion. And we're gonna go to the, the, the Q&A section. So if you do have a question and you'd like to pose a question, please put it into the Q&A. And we do have a few teed up. Um, so I'm just gonna um, go through them as we see them. And uh, a couple of questions actually about the payment for order flow and the impact on the marketplace. And these two kind of go together. So we'll just combine them. So could we comment on uh, payment for order flow and the information contained in that and how the market maker might use that? And then secondly, is that effectively like a disguised commission because it's a hidden cost to Robinhood traders? Right. Uh, first of all, yes. Uh, in fact, um, I wrote a paper about 20 years ago with uh, Brad, Barbara, and Ning Zhu, and, and we, um, we figured out that if it, the information that we used when we wrote that paper was, uh, was essentially what were individuals doing. And we looked at that and said, well, if, but the technology changed and we couldn't get that data anymore. We looked at it and said, well, if you had that information in real time, you could make a lot of money because we we're able to go through and predict how markets would behave over short periods of time based on what individual investors had just done. And it's because the trading of individual investors is highly correlated in time series. If you knew what they were doing now, you know, today, you have a good idea what they're gonna to do tomorrow. So yes, getting a look at what these people are doing is valuable and I'm sure that's, that's one big reason for paying for order flow. The other pay, reason for paying for order flow is you get to collect the bid-ask spread uh, without uh, dealing with much adverse or, or asymmetric information risk. 
So these market makers know that the average Robin Hood or Schwab or Ameritrade investor, on average, they don't have inside information of the sort that a market maker would worry about. A market maker doesn't want to place tr trade with someone who knows more than he or she does. And they figured these people mostly don't. So they collect the spread. Um, there is a uh, paper, and I am not the author of it. Um, see if we get it here. Uh, no, I'm not. So, um, Eaton and Green and I'm not sure. Oh yeah, Eaton, Green, Roseman and Wu have a working paper also looks at Robin Hood, uh, different context. And in their first table, they show the spreads charged by Robin Hood market makers versus other market makers. And I'm looking here and they have an average, a mean spread of 3.3% from Robinhood market makers and 1.86% for other market makers. And these are for stocks commonly held by Robinhood investors. So they're getting a spread. They're getting, they're tending to get a large spread and they're getting first look at, at what's probably value, is certainly valuable information. Yeah. So look, so the dimensions of Robinhood's risky book from the Robinhood trader standpoint, but it's it's all these characteristics we talked about, lots of options, lots of limit orders, volatile stocks um, on which a market maker you know, might, might find ways to profit. Here's another really interesting question. Did you find in your study of Robinhood traders any evidence of learning by the first time investors? So for example, did the, the accounts of the GameStop traders you know, go dormant at any point or were there other changes in behavior through time? Good question. Uh, the answer is with Robinhood, no. And it's there are two reasons that we don't. The first is we don't get to follow this. We have no ID for, for different people, users. We can't follow the same person's behavior through time. Second, we're only looking at a little over two years of data. However, I have looked at that question um, uh, in, in another study uh, with Jane Liu and Brad Barber and co-authors in Taiwan, where we have the trading records for every single Taiwan account on the Taiwan Stock Exchange over, I think it's an 18 year period. And we can follow accounts through time. And we look at day traders. And what we find is that day traders learn and they learn very, very slowly. <laughs> so you find day traders who are losing money are more likely to stop than those who are making money. But you find people who have been losing money year after year for years who are still day trading. So yeah, people learn, but they don't, you know, they, they ain't learning fast. And I can't say for sure that's what's going on in Robinhood, but my guess is it is. And, and, and without knowing, you know, without knowing the details, like per account details, but it does bring up some of your other earlier research since you just mentioned it, that there, there are also, this is also bound to different perceptions of time, um, different cultural viewpoints, um, that you found differences in behavior across all, all kinds of different segments of the population. And would that be something that would be the subject of a, a future study? Well, sure. So I have another, st another study. Uh, it's a, a working paper where we look at the use of um, margin. And we find that people who use margin tend to be overconfident. So this, we use some survey information. We find that these people rate themselves as knowing more than they know when they take simple financial literacy questions. The people who rate themselves more highly they say than, than they should tend to use margin more than other investors. Use margin, not simply have a margin account, but use margin. And they tend to trade more speculatively and uh, they tend to perform less well. So yeah, the, that's 
one one group there's other evidence you know there there are lots of people who have studied individual investors in general we find that less sophisticated investors tend to trade more speculatively do less well men trade more actively than women and that hurts their returns uh younger people trade tend to trade more actively some of these things are kind of what you'd expect so maybe a uh, last question, um, just to return to this this idea of, of Wall Street bets and, and the Reddit traders. And I did do an entertaining comparison for myself of logging onto Roblox, another hot stock, which is, for those of you who don't know, the gaming platform on which you can find a game that says stock market bets. And if you look at that and compare it side by side with the uh, Reddit trading site, uh, Wall Street bets, they look remarkably similar, just saying. but the question has to do with uh, social media platforms like Reddit and potentially others and the emergence of influencers, you know, people pitching stocks or giving investment advice on, on places like YouTube or, or TikTok. Um, is this something that you think is here to stay or do you think it's just a, a bull market kind of fad? I suppose both, right? I mean, yes, it's probably here to stay. And I, uh, but also activity will probably wane. You know, we saw back in 1999, 2000, a phenomenal amount of excitement about internet stocks. NASDAQ went up, what, 46% one year, then came crashing down. Uh, there's money lost, companies went out of business, but pretty much, you know, the internet is still with us. Um, and I'm sure that people uh, will be, and it's going to take a technology change. I can't imagine what it is to undo the influencer, the, you know, the thing we were talking about, the, the, the radicalizing of, of people able to just go and talk to others who believe the same things they already do, this reinforcement of beliefs. Um, actually, I'd like to end on one, my part on, on one thing. You know, the um, Robin Hood says that their 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 mission is to to democratize investing for all. I'd just like to point out that that was already done, and it was done by Jack Bogle. Jack Bogle many years ago made it easy and inexpensive for people to buy and hold a well-diversified portfolio that democratized investing for all. Uh, if, if Robinhood has democratized something, it's been trading, not investing. I think that's a fantastic note to end on. And um, please are, accept our incredibly warm thanks for participating in our fireside chat tonight. I know the audience um, really appreciated you being here and having such an interesting conversation, putting Robinhood in this context of behavioral finance, and also just a very up-to-date look at the implications of fintech for markets in general. So thank you so much for being here with us, Professor Odin. Big virtual hand for you from everybody. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Thank you for all, to all the attendees and also all the folks who made this evening possible. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Bye now.